there, folks. Thanks for coming. There's sort of this warmth beaming this way, and it feels good uh, to be in front of you. I don't know. Uh, we jump right in. 60 seconds. You're sitting next to somebody who's now your partner. Well, what that does for those of you who are like in a row of five is, is it leaves somebody out. So the quick thing to do if you're left out is to kind of raise your hand, look around, and just gather with somebody else. You're going to be with them for all of, you know, this long. It's not long. So you can do it on your feet. But the, the important thing is to pair up quickly, right? Don't leave yourself out. You got to do it in a group of two. Pair up. So I know, like, maybe that was the exercise. You've, like, you've already divin in. You're chatting. This is a little bit more structured than that. 60 seconds, big decision of the afternoon. Decide who's A, decide who's A. So, so complete, uh, let's see if we can do this. I know this uh, ebullience that's here. Uh, decide who's A and who's B right now. Just make a quick A, B, ah. It's very random. All right? So what the heck, let's, let's have the Bs you're gonna talk first. 60 seconds. B, you're going to do something impossible. And depending on how well your partner already knows you, you might have to dig deeper if they already kind of know you on at least at some level. You are going to, big breath, tell them every detail, your entire life story, all of it in 60 seconds. Go. <laughs> all right, A's. So we're going to be testing your attentive skills because A's, you've got a different task. We're going to give you half the amount of time to do something different, 30 seconds, to summarize what they just told you. You're going to give them back their life story, 30 seconds, do your best. And if you forgot, if it's all flo flown out of your head or you were just nodding and smiling and pretending, oh, <laughs> right? make something up that makes them feel really good about what they, you know, their lives. All right, 30 seconds, summarize, go. Time. All right. So, so go ahead and drop. Make sure that we, uh, we're going to try to run through this pretty quickly. It's tempting to then want to talk about that, but not quite yet because we have to flip roles. Okay. All right. Age, you kind of know what you're up for. 60 seconds, full seconds, but get every single detail, your entire life story. Go. <laughs> One and time. Ooh, under the wire. All right. Give them a little hand, B. Give them a little hand. All right, and I'm going to give the, uh, give the B side now, who's going to summarize, a slightly different uh, framing for this, just slightly. You still just have 30 seconds. You're going to give it back to them as best you can. But it's tempting when you've got kind of data packed in your head, which is what this is. They just gave you some information, 60 seconds worth. Well, I could summarize that. It's tempting to repeat it back as data, almost like, well, you went here and here, and then this step, and then this school, and that. Did I get it? Right? as if it was a memorization exercise. And it, it's more than that. It's a connective exercise. This is somebody's life story. It's not data so much as somebody's flow. So do what you can, now that I've chatted and uh, the details are flying out of your head. <laughs> do what you can to knit it together, but really to give it to them in a kind of a coaching tone or a like, eh, here's what I heard you say. And you're going to give them a little story back to them, right? Looking at them while you're telling. Do your best. Go. One and time. 30 seconds. Woo. All right. So I'd say take, I'm, I'm going to give you, give everybody in the room just, just one more minute in an informal way. This was structured, this had a, um, to just chat with your partner, but the two prompts are, tell them what it was like to be challenged with this 60 second uh, limit. Did you enjoy that? Do you frustrated? Are you glad uh, that you shared what you shared, or do you wish you'd shared something a little more or less personal? Tell them what it was like, and then tell them what it was like to hear it back. You might have learned something interesting or felt something interesting. Talk about it for a little bit. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to hear from a couple of people, and let's give it a try if we can do this without having the mic run around. It would be lovely if we can. So it does mean if you're going to raise your hand and speak, be willing to commit to speaking way across the room. What was it like, somebody willing to throw up your hand, what was it like simply the first step, pushing your story out in 60 seconds? What was interesting? How was that? Yeah, give us a sense. Uh, factual, no story. Uh, say it a little bit louder. Factual, no 
No story. Factual, no story, yeah. I, I wonder, you know, there's probably a good number who share that as well. It's a pretty common way to go. We kind of go through the list, etc. It's impossible to do. So why not just pick a few? Yep. And you had a hand up. Well, I was going to say, my resume, like I rattled off my resume, and the afterthought was my personal family. <laughs> yeah, good thing the family didn't hear you yeah. not talk about it, right? Yeah. 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 Anybody take a different tap than the kind of resume approach? Different? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm a salesman. So my first question was, what's your passion? I followed that question for you for fun. I had no idea what it was. But she actually kind of took the passion into her work, which is good. She's good. She's good. So, okay, so, um, so when, did you, when did you throw that in, those questions? Those were my first two questions. The first time you told me to look at her and ask a question, I didn't know that. Huh, okay, yeah. That was, uh, got it. So you were looking for underneath. Yep. For what's, yep. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, often people who are not only in sales but successful at it uh, do a lot of the things that we're going to be doing. I'm pointing at the board here for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes or so. They sort of have these in their bones. Um, what was it like to hear your story back? What was interesting? Anybody have something that was, uh, yeah, very back now. Yeah, so I felt like when uh, he said the story back in a different way, that he understood what I said, not just repeating my words, but kind of like, he got it because he said it in a different way that yeah. reflected more meaning than what I said. Yeah. Uh, did your partner have me go second in terms of the repeating? Because that's where I, I put a little bit of filter. It's, it's almost not fair, right, for the first round where you don't get to hear it back through this kind of a little warmer story uh, oriented lilt. Yeah. I was actually very surprised when you kind of connected some things together and ah. observations about like some of the things that drive me and how I am. Wow. That was kind of surprising to me when you get Yeah. yeah. Do you do know each other? We do, but not 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 at that level. Not like that. Yeah, right. So uh, I've been glinting off. Philip, is he Philippe? Philippe. Uh, I have no idea, but um, my guess is that you've got some skills around this, where you can kind of discern just from what you've heard that there are some things underneath that might. Who knows? You took a kind of intuitive leap on this. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was dipping our toe into the shallow water, and we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper as we, as we go. Uh, hello, alumni. And it just, I was realizing this morning, so I built this one, because I am one of those too. So hello, fellow tribe. Um, and I, I'll say just briefly that uh, I get to stand here purely because I opted to come to Haas and uh, go through the MBA program 10 years ago for me. I was late in life, really. I'm 56 now, so I was in my mid-40s. And I uh, just had my, my daughter in, in the middle of that program, and any of you for whom that happened uh, with a child as well. It was uh, a crucible. <laughs> and it was a very meaningful program, but it, it changed certainly how I feel about what I get to do as a human being. I was a filmmaker for about a dozen years before that, freelance pro producer. Um, made a good living, but it really wasn't something I was great at, for one. Good enough to get paid, but not uh, uh, flourishing, let's say, and also just done with it, kind of I had, had my arc. This, for the last 10 years, which I've gotten to do because of this program, I kind of stumbled into teaching an elective right after. Love that. I went home the first day and went, Susan, to my wife, this is, I love this fit. Um, became, I just aimed at, I want to become full-time here because I like it so much. And I still, to this day, get to do things like this and work with uh, companies uh, around the Bay Area and around the world doing soft skills, which I really care about and haven't gotten tired of yet. I believe in them as a way to um, lean into being in work environments where you're actually pretty pressured, right? I get to work with the US military and, and, and seeing if my stuff would work there or the full-time MBA program where, uh, I don't know if you're full-timers, but you, you can show up a little bit like, yeah, show me, right? Which I really respect. So uh, I'm in kind of professional heaven and it's because of this program. Uh, I hope that's true for some of you. Rapport. It's this word that sounds kind of fancy because Americans like it when we don't pronounce the T. Rapport. Ooh, yeah. And it's kind of simple, right? Characterized by ease of exchange, feelings of trust. Why should you care? Well, it's a little rhetorical for a sophisticated audience like this, right? But I'd like to hear the obvious answers. What are just be willing to popcorn? What are some reasons? One or two word answers. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, to counter, to counter abrasiveness, especially if you're selling, right? It's kind of, <laughs> uh, let's go here. 
report leads to free flow of information, and free flow of information leads to better decisions. Boy, nice, yeah, nicely put. There is a kind of efficiency that comes, right? And, and all kinds of information, whether it's just specifically the kind of data around a project, or maybe some news that's from the kind of edges that you're not in touch with that could be really informative about sea changes that are occurring. Yes? It makes a business puzzle. It, isn't that something as simple as that? Like, it's fun. It makes things nice. And, you know, we could, we could uh, make a metric out of that, like retention, right? We can keep people longer, um, stay with the company. But absolutely, we're kind of here on this planet for our, what is it? Maybe we get 70, 80 years, who knows? It's good to spend uh, time in environments where you're enjoying yourself. There's fuel there. Last couple we'll do here, and then I'll come to Fabio in the front. Uh, people work harder and better for people that they like. There's, yeah, absolutely. And, and we'll um, then, uh, if you uh, feel, um, I don't know, like you're seen by your boss and they work you, they ask you to work late because of a, a deadline that, yeah, of course I will, right? Uh, last one, Fabio. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a, a huge part of motivation, right? We can, we can boss people, boss at people. There's a, a little metaphor that we use, power versus influence. Um, the idea of a hierarchical organization, it kind of needs a fair amount of directivity in it. We've been building uh, large things for the last several thousand years. The pyramids were built through a really kind of amazing bureaucratic structure, if you read about it. Uh, and they use essentially rewards and punishments. It's not a bad way to get things done. Uh, you have to pay people and uh, perhaps give them corrective measures. But a flatter organization, which is, um, seems to be the trend, I certainly get pulled down to Silicon Valley to do consulting to help kind of um, make communication more fluid across the organization, it takes this, it takes real skills in leaning into rapport and trust. And so I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna give you three tools today, creating a connection, which we'll be about to do to give you some very fundamental skills there. Bringing your full presence is a second because we, we connect with people who we both trust and trust has this equation of warmth and respect, right? So we really want to be our full selves and giving and receiving value. It's kind of obvious there are ways to do that. Creating a connection. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna try our first big choreographed exercise. So here's what it is going to look at like and then uh, and we'll, we'll stumble our way through it. Because you're kind of packed in rows you're going to need to be with one other person like you were. Try to find somebody who you don't know. So introduce yourself to a stranger and just pair up. I would, I would push many of us back into this just so that you kind of have some room because you want to be all standing, but the rows are too crowded. So simple as that. Once you're all there and you've kind of said hi, I'm going to give you specific uh, directions for this three-minute exercise. All right? Common ground. Stand up. If you need a partner, I think three times we're going to say, stand up, get a partner, right? If you need one, there's a little trick for it in really any situation when there's a big gathering. Often when we say find a partner, people go like, oh no, right? I'll be left out. The old junior high dance floor thing. So here it is. If you really do look around and people have been chosen, just put your hand up bravely. Got to do that. But it also means opening your eyes kind of wide so you can actually see. You're not kind of in your little shell. And as soon as you see somebody else who's got their, their, uh, their hand up and catch their eye, walk right toward them, right? Select them, sort of take them off the dance floor. They'll be grateful that, that you're coming at them. So anybody need a partner still? Got one, and uh, Julie, would you be willing to give up and, or you got, oh no, you got a partner. Oh, okay. Uh, that's gonna be okay. You're actually, you're gonna, uh, like again, if you do happen to know the person you're with, go a little deeper. All right, this is called common ground. It's very simple. You're going to have a very loose three-minute conversation. You'll hear my voice saying, time's up, so don't, don't have to track it. And you're going to try to find three things that you have in common with this person. Well, golly, that's easy. Uh, you could say, we, we, both, we both have hair. I don't know. You know we, uh, <laughs> or our feet reach the ground, or we're, we're both Haas alums, right? Easy, too easy. So it's not about gathering the kind of big list. You could do that in 20 seconds. You can get 100 things. It's not that. It's roughly finding three things. I don't care if it's two or five, just a few things. And these need to be below the surface. Slightly below the surface, but they could be on the level of values or things that you're interested in or past experience or family. We both have blank, right? So you've got to dig a little bit and you've got to open up a little bit. 
Have this casual conversation. When you find one thing that you have in common, just clock it, say, okay, there's one, and move to somewhere else, new territory, and wait until you hear my voice. I'll interrupt you in about three minutes. Go. <laughs> time to finish. <laughs> time, time to pause. My goodness. These are, these are lovely interactions and, uh, and, uh, and to pause on it. Who's willing to throw up your hand and just share with everybody in the room one simple thing that you learned that was maybe a little bit unexpected that you have in common? Yes? We both were in Evanston. You were in Evanston? For Northwestern. Yeah. Uh -huh. For different schools. Yep. Different stuff related. Yeah. Not a huge city. Yep. Somebody else. Yeah. We both did sauces together. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't know that before, right? Yeah. Yeah. Last one. Yeah. We both were in Iraq. Both of us. Both happen to be born abroad, and you kind of stumble upon that somehow with this kind of directive of find something slightly below the surface. Great, those are good examples. Uh, I'm going to give you, are you going to do this in a second round with a different person, but before we move there, I'm going to give you two tools that are uh, um, designed to really let you move in an intentional way into finding common ground. It really happens norm naturally, and you did these. And yet, let's make them conscious. The first one is called intentional self-disclosure. It's kind of simple. It means what it says, right? Where you actually reveal something about yourself that has a little bit of meaning. It's not just the small talk at the surface. It's a little bit. And you're kind of fishing almost, right? And we do this sometimes. We sort of tell a little bit about ourselves. And the listener either says, oh, yeah, that works for me. Or they'll say, no, nope, not there. And, and maybe they'll offer up something. But so you can volitionally put that out. The second one is this is you have the permission this weekend and in this exercise to ask slightly more personal questions than you might normally ask, right? So when I put down below, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but it says both involve taking a small expressive risk, a little bit of a risk, so they feel like, oh, should I ask that? Oh, what the heck, right? That kind of vibe. So one example, I don't know if it works for this population, but with my students on campus, I'll suggest, oh, you could ask somebody, are you religious, right? Or maybe a political question, whatever it is, right? <laughs> but it is a little bit risky, not too deep, not too personal. <clears throat> um, and that said, it should feel a little bit risky, yeah? And uh, I would say with your next partner, and you're just gonna grab somebody local, in other words, kind of turn and find the, the nearest. And again, if you get left out, raise your hand and, and uh, find a partner with their hands up. Try one of these or both of these. You're gonna have about three minutes New partner, three things in common. Go. You, you might end up tagging this and you'll, you'll follow up later because these look to me from the outside even more natural this time around. It's fun to watch people's faces where you're really engaged and listening. Uh, so let's try the same thing. Somebody thrust up your hand and share with us one thing you discovered that was a little bit surprising. Yes? Yeah, which, what is it? Bernadette. Bernadette, and you happen to both be Bernadette. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Yes? Uh, we both have a passion to get out there and change politics. Yeah. No. She's doing something about it, I'm going to start. Hey, there we go, yeah. Wow. Yeah, values exchanged. Uh, did anybody try an intentional self-disclosure where you actually were kind of conscious, like, oh, he told me to try it, and I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mihir, would you be willing to share with us, and if not, it's, it's a big public space, so yeah, no big deal, all right. What was it? I, I told uh, Fran that I'm a bit more risk and worse person. I have taken a uh, big risk in life. Yeah. And then yeah. I thought that I'm the same way. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> you can both, and you're here, right, yeah. Uh, good. And how about the other one? So with the asking slightly more personal question, we won't ask for the answer that you receive. But what's a personal question that you... You said it was the worst. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just know that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that was, that, you kind of went deeper on that. Yep, yeah, you took that risk. Um, yeah, what was one that you asked? I started by asking what is the biggest fear is one of the professional Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. right. Uh, yeah, thank you for giving that signal. We're not, we're not hearing everybody. It was, the question was, what's your biggest fear about your professional life? Yeah. These are good examples, and in a way, we gave you that permission 
Go ahead and um, let's, let's have you thank your partner and, and find your seats. There's a, remember our, our first, our first uh, pillar of, of building rapport, our first pillar of building rapport is finding common ground. And it's one of those uh, phenomenons that social psychologists love to study. This notion that when two strangers come uh, together and discover they have a little something in common, what happens with that? The, lots of studies that are, most of them pretty amusing um, because it has a large effect once we discover this. And, and my, my favorite that I've come across comes from a, a university that put out a call for volunteers. It was this, the psych department, a large university. And um, the call to volunteers went out to both the campus and to the wider uh, town that this was in. So they got roughly two, three hundred volunteers to come in for this, and uh, they stated out loud that they were they were studying whether the uh, phenomenon of astrology, like what sign you were born under, uh, would would matter uh, in terms of um, people having things in common. Right? We're going to get to the bottom of this. Is there any there there? Now they weren't actually studying that, but because of that, the first thing they could ask the volunteer when they walked in the door was, "When's your birthday?" Right? They got to find that out. Well, they had set it up where they would have a volunteer come for their one o'clock appointment and a second person would also, pretending to be part of the volunteer corps, show up as well. Now this is a confederate, part of the deal, they're an actor, they blend it in and they said, yep, we're both here for our appointment, same time. Two people are going to be questioned and the first question that comes uh, out is, when's your birthday? The volunteer would give their real birthday, right? They'd say March 6th. Well, the confederate, well trained, would just go, wow, that's crazy, me too. They would pretend that their birthday was also March 6th, right? And the three of them would have a little laugh about that. Oh, that's a coincidence, all right. And they would move forward, no big deal, with the uh, series of questions that took 30 minutes. And they were questions about both of their lives. And the Confederate, who uh, they, they had a little background that he could read up on, he or she, uh, they just made sure that everything that they said, because they can say anything, didn't match with the other person's life, such that at the end, it was like, wow, we didn't have much at all in common, period. That was it. At the very end, the psychologist says, you're free to go, thank you. Uh, and uh, they're leaving. The Confederate makes a bit of a show. They turn to the uh, volunteer, and they're very embarrassed. And they're like, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I know you got to go, and I, I hate to ask this. Look, I'm taking this adult education course, uh, and we meet tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Look, I've got this in my bag, this 20-page uh, rough draft of a, of a paper uh, I'm supposed to write. And I know it sounds crazy, but I'm supposed to find like a, a stranger to take it home with them and uh, uh, write up two pages of notes and send them to me. It's nuts, right? It's uh, birthdays are the same. And then they ask for a huge favor. It was always that favor. They had that down pat, right? And the poor person who's like receiving this request is like, oh, you know, I don't want to, but you know, we want to be nice. And so they, wrote, they ran this blind version for uh, a big portion where they did not have the birthdays be the same either. So nothing's the same, but we're going to make this request cold, right? And still a third of the people said yes, right, to this. I'll do that and use up three hours of my evening. We're nice. We want to help, right? And it was like about a third of them actually followed through and did it. It was crazy. Well, uh, when the birthdays were sprinkled in at the beginning, and think about that, it's a half hour ago, it's no big deal, it doesn't matter, they've probably forgotten it. They made the same request verbatim. 62, it almost doubles. Yeah, exactly. Like, like we, we really, we were looking for connection. They have this third wrinkle, they were amazed when they said it was, shouldn't have had this big effect, it, it, it did. Um, where they, um, they had another roughly 80 people come in, crunch the data, where what they did is they said the birthdays would be the same, and then um, upon arriving in the door, they would take their fingerprints, both of them. They'd make kind of a show of it, official fingerprint, right? And they said, we're going to take these to our lab and analyze them. And then they would they'd hustle them back behind the curtain as if there was a lab back there. And, uh, and about 15 minutes through the questioning, the lab assistant would come running out the, from behind, really excited, saying, we analyzed these fingerprints. You, you, you won't believe this. Both of you have this really rare type E fingerprint, right? Those people are like, oh, oh really? And only 2% of the world's population has this fingerprint. And again, they would have a little like, it's like, oh, wow, well, that's unusual. And then they would march on with the questions, nothing in common, make the request, and 80% of the people said yes to this. It's a little like disheartening almost, right? Oh, yeah. 
So uh, our, our little, uh, back to this idea of intentional self-disclosure and slightly more personal questions, they will lead you to find some things that you'll have in common. It's the way we start to make connections. Now, please don't go out and lie about your birthday and uh, 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 misuse the, uh, the data. But there is a way that we are hungry. And as soon as we meet somebody, we're scanning pretty unconsciously, how, how could I connect with them at all, right? And giving them a little bit of a handle, giving yourself a little handle is a start. We sort of start with commonalities, a bit of trust builds, and then differences become really interesting. We want to know those too, right? All right, that was number one, is creating a connection by using those two tools. The second one is bringing your full presence. We are gonna roar, uh, roar right into this one. It's a pretty quick exercise. It's gonna take, I don't know, maybe five minutes on our feet. So like the first one, I'm gonna have you stand up, grab another person you don't know, and find a place in the room that you can be with them, and I'll give you the instructions. Okay, nobody's left out, we're good? Because we have, we have a, a ringer on deck. All right, with your partner, turn back to back. This is, this is different. You want to stand back to back. All right, you want your hands free. If you can set stuff down just on, your, by, on the floor is fine. You want both hands free, all right? This is pretty, um, these are, these are, you're going to have um, a series of three interactions that are all pretend scenarios. So kind of, you know, be willing to play with this, but play them kind of seriously. Like try to, try to play it for real, if you will. And the very first one is this. You are imagining yourself, you've flown to a conference somewhere, and it's in uh, a generic industry. It's important that we don't make it too specific. But it's your industry, you're going to the, um, the conference, and uh, you're meeting people. It's the first night, networking event, and you don't know anybody there. And it happens to be that you're feeling actually quite shy and nervous. Now, for some of you, it may be the way you show up at conferences, right, where there are lots of introverts in the room. For others, that might be an acting stretch, because you're just not that way. So you're going to have to stretch your muscles a little bit. But we know what it looks like. If you were to pretend to be shy and nervous, you would probably stare at your shoes and um and ah a little bit. Hard to make eye contact. Voice is probably not that loud, right? Um, so your partner's gonna be doing the exact same thing, so it's a little weird, like there's not a whole lot of interaction, but power through this. You're only going for about 45 seconds. So tolerate what's there, but play it for real. Go for it, all right? Tur uh, oh, could you be silent? Uh, not entirely, struggle to get some words out. You wanna introduce yourself, start with that. You're gonna shake hands, you're gonna maybe share, like ask a question, like how's it going? But I'm not giving you anything else to talk about. It's intentional, right? It's just 30 or 40 seconds. Shy and nervous, go. Face down, turn and go. <laughs> Good question. Let that go and turn back to back. Turn back to back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, not give you time to kind of talk about it or start to, to pull it apart. And just review what that felt like quietly in your own mind, right? You feel really awkward, was it hard, was it natural, I don't know. Uh, Second round, wipe that one clean. The second one has some similarity in that you're gonna say that we're, you're gonna send you off to a conference, and it's the first night, so you're meeting somebody you've never met before, but this one's different. Because there are reputations that get around in, in professional circles, and in fact, the person that you um, are meeting, that you're gonna shake hands with, you've heard about them before. And in fact, you've heard really pretty great things about them, that you think you're probably gonna like them, and that you're probably gonna uh, actually, they're, they're kind of important so that you respect them. And so you might feel a little bit of almost respect or awe or wonder. At, you get to meet this person. It's a big deal. And uh, they're going to be feeling the same toward you. So that can be a little strange to navigate. But just take in some of their energy if they do shine it at you. And uh, go through this one as well, about 30 seconds. Turn, go. Turn back to back. Back to back, go back to back again. Last round. But before we move, uh, review again what that one felt like and kind of compare it to the first round. I certainly noticed that the, uh, the volume kind of doubled in the room, so at least a little bit of liveliness happening. Uh, last one, this one's quite different. This person who you're standing back to back with is somebody who you haven't seen them in, I don't know what your age is, but 20, 30 years, it's been a long time, and here's why. 
They were your very best childhood friend when you were five years old. So imagine you're the same age. Just let just make that okay. And for five years, you played with them every single day. You had birthdays together. You would get into trouble together. You grew together. They were kind of your soulmate, playmate. You loved them. And when you were 10, one of you, your families had to pack up and move out of state or out of country. You, you lost touch. And for some reason, you know, there, there was no, uh, you, didn't, you didn't keep up with them. And you've always kind of carried a candle for this, right, this person. But you've given up hope that you would ever see them again. Well, you're at uh, SFO, you're at the airport. Either somebody's coming off the plane, you or maybe they, it's a random, one of those random one in a million encounters. The person you're about to turn around and see was your very best childhood friend and you recognize them instantly. Turn. <laughs> that was amazing. Every time. So, so well played for one, like you really committed to the, uh, to the role. Half of you hugged, it was a full embrace, so that's commitment. Um, we we, we want to spend like one, one minute uh, that I'm going to give you to just kind of loosen up with your partner and just talk through those three scenarios really quickly. Just get curious about what for you to do the shy, awkward one. What was it like? How about that second one? It was a little bit different when I had like this respect that I was bringing. And how about that last one? So chat with your partner for a minute and then we'll have you a seat. It's real quick to see what collective experience is in the room. Uh, somebody shout out, shout out answers to this one. Yeah. I think what we felt was that if you are some Awesome. Yeah. It's very unnatural that you stay shy and normal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You had to really act. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted that session to end. It felt so good. I just wanted that session to end. It felt so long. So I had planned to go for a full 45, and I was just watching the pain on a lot of things. So we went about like 25 seconds. It was very short, that one, right? And fair enough, right? And you're right that you are Haas students, and so it might have been hard to do that, but I would guess most people in the room had some level of access to really feeling kind of like, oh, this is like long and uncomfortable, right? Even though you were just pretending. The second one, I'm curious, what, what, did, what was a noticeable difference with that one? <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. I'm, I'm so glad you could take that in, right? They're like, oh, they're happy to meet you too. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. No, it's not. It's true. Yeah. That there, there's that. Uh, that said, it feels better. Simply that uh, at the simple level. There's a way that um, some folks have really learned to kind of navigate their shyness and and in terms of meeting others or, or getting more comfortable with networking, which for a lot of people, even once you become pretty pretty salty and seasoned, is still like, oh, uh, there's something there that comes up, old stuff is they do a little bit of a heuristic, which is to pretend that the people that they're meeting are somebody who they're really happy to meet, or pretend that the other person is a, is a genius. That's another one where you like, like, not in terms of like a crazy genius, holy cow, but just really intelligent, and you just kind of make that assumption. There's a way that a small little mental can have you go like, oh, I'm suddenly interacting, and once you start, you kind of, you, you get, Momentum happens, right? You've got a little bit of, and you don't have to pretend anything after that because pretending is only a tool for a little bit of a jump start. After that, you want to be as authentic as you can be. How about that third one? What's that like? Fun. Fun is the first word. Like, yeah, it looks fun. What else? A couple of other adjectives. Warm. Warm. Easy. I heard. Anything else? What, did you say that again? It was pretty deep. I, I'm, I'm a little touched hearing that, really, because uh, you know, we're just pretending. This is an old childhood friend, but uh, we often have kind of fond nostalgia, and there's a way that you probably just assumed trust, right? Somebody's coming at you like this, and you're like, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, often people say it's the most authentic, and yet it had the most elaborate setup, right? We're just pretending. It's quite magical, and there are many ways that um, we could frame this exercise. Uh, I teach pretty regularly at Pixar, and I do emotional intelligence there. 
And um, so I'll do this exercise just to kind of jumpstart the idea that we are physical beings. We don't live all entirely up here, and this gets you into your body. And what about that? What kind of feelings can we put linguistics around language? Where I'm wanting to go is this idea of full presence with this one, right? Because there's a way that we can kind of bring ourselves our full focus, which that last one, you were probably very focused, until, you know, if I had to let that go on for another three minutes, you would have been like, well, where do we really go with this, right? It has its limit. If you bring your full body, your full self, and contrast that with the very first one, where, you know, whatever exaggerated behaviors you had, there's kind of a slumping, and your chest is a little collapsed, et cetera. These little, little bits of, like, I'm really here, I'm really fully with you, serve our connection. We want a combination of warmth and strength when we're trying to connect with somebody. That's where we're going to build trust. It's something that it needs kind of both of those to have the combination really work. We have time. We have 15 minutes left. There's, uh, some of you uh, may know this quote. The idea of how do you translate this into the vernacular, what would you say? Fake it till you make it. Yes. I have a few Leadcom MBA students who uh, lovely to see your faces, and we've used this for years. It is one way to grow, right? And often when we're adults, we've kind of become like locked into our ways to some degree, and there's something very important about integrity, and it can be hard to kind of fake anything, really. And we never want to be faking for long, but the idea of jump-starting yourself uh, into new behaviors and then taking and expanding your identity uh, is what Shakespeare is encouraging. This last one, give and receive value. So this is a rhetorical question. I'm going to set up a little framing for you to give you um, a setup for a, a very short coaching exercise that you're going to get to do with each other. What are soft skills? Well, this is a, it's a, it can be a useful framing, hard skill examples. There's your old MBA curriculum, right? <laughs> yeah. Or your undergraduate curriculum. It's, this, it's a, a very similar, right? Uh, and what do these have in common if you were trying to describe this list? What are some characteristics? That these at a core level have in common? Logical. Functional, logical, fact based, technical. technical. Left brain. Left, yeah, left brain. You could, you, could do, you could learn them out of a book to some degree. Right? Sure, all of those you could practice, many of them alone in your corner CFO office. <laughs> Soft skill examples. It's a pretty different list. You can bifurcate kind of the, the umbrella of leadership skills. And it's kind of fun to say, like, oh, yeah, those really are different, and they're both incredibly important. I'm guessing that since you've graduated that you've leaned more and more into these, if you're a growing human being, and if your career is challenging you, where it's much more about kind of mentoring and building relationships and sustaining them. What does this have in common? What, these, I, these are all what? What are some? Very personal, interpersonal is what, yep, yeah, yep, it requires another human. Anything else? Yeah, I, I would agree, yeah, if you've kind of got those, maybe you could transfer industries and, you know, then study up like crazy to get uh, familiar enough with the language of a new, a new function. Yes? A little bit louder, they're all rooted. I'd say so. Sometimes I hear emotional intelligence uh, for all of these, right? There can be some kind of, uh, kind of self-limiting assumptions about these that, oh, well, you, of course you could learn these. You just apply yourself. But these are more like fixed, right? It's like a half-truth of that. Your family system might have given you facility with some of these or your culture. But as soon as we start thinking, like, I can never be a good negotiator because I hate negotiation, it's, it's a story more than it is fact. I mean, you might hate it, but that if you sort of drill into that, you can limit yourself. So the idea that we can always be learning these, right? So these are the ones that are going to be the spine for our exercise. And here it is. You can just take a minute sitting, sitting by yourselves to identify one from that list. That's not your strongest attribute. Something that, and it says make some notes. These, these can be mental. If you wanted to scribble a thing or two, that's fine. Let me give you about a minute to just collect some thoughts on how the skill you've chosen would, would be very specific to you now in whatever function you're doing or in your uh, personal life as well. I'm fairly, I'm fairly open to saying personal and professional are often just integrated. It doesn't really matter where they give value. 
So you do want to pick one and, you know, or something that would, if, you, if none of these resonate, pick something that would be a soft skill that you're like, hmm, that's very specific. I really want to be able to do that. All right? And what the coaching exercise is going to look like is you're going to do this normal thing where you stand up and you, you find partners, right? And here's the prompt. You're going to tell your partner. You're going to describe why it would help you get in your career. And then together, you can say brainstorm ways, get some dialogue going. Let your partner help you. Maybe they've got a little facility in this. They could ask you, what have you tried? That's it. And you're going to have about two minutes each way. So it takes a little you know, choreography. And you'll hear my voice. I'll say, all right, time to switch. Oh. Jump up. Dive in. Last time on our feet. <laughs> You know, again, I, I sort of um, urge you if you really, if you had a good conversation and you were a little like, why are we stopping, right? You could track them down and sort of like, let's, let's follow up. Um, I want to reverse the order here. Just, just to start here, just to hear from a couple of folks with this one, not the value, but the, uh, the trust. Any, anything come to mind when you play it back, when you first started to talk to this person, or maybe it was the way they responded? What's an example of a behavior that your partner exhibited? Yeah. Great eye contact, isn't it as simple as that? And who was your partner? Yeah, way to go, eye contact, right? <laughs> Especially when we're talking, we want to be looking at the other human being, right? And, and the, the data is roughly 70% of the time, right? Which is interesting, as I've, uh, I'm sure it's sometimes it's like most of the time, but that's really two thirds. It's not like the stare down, like I'm really, really looking. <laughs> but it's also not kind of, you know, being kind of distracted or, or um, uh, not, the connection really matters. Somebody else, different behavior, yeah. And, you, and did you personally notice, Mateo, like when that happened with your partner, did you just notice a kind of affected head on you? Simple as that, yeah. And maybe a willingness or a desire to be reciprocal. Yeah, it's exchange, right? Somebody comes, they're brave enough to be open and tell you a little bit of a, I'm not so good at this. And often we're like, oh, I'm gonna give that back, right? It loosens us up. The person who offered that at first is the brave person, right? I mean, not of the, not of the pair, that's the brave one, but it is a, an act of bravery. It's the one way, when I, I mentioned that I've worked with um, really senior military combat officers, I kind of stumbled into that in 2010, and I've been doing it ever since. And I thought, holy cow, I'm, it's not my culture, I'm gonna get, you know, and I teach kind of touchy-feely stuff. That was the code, when I kind of stumbled across this notion that the vulnerabilities that I often ask for in some exercises I do, you frame that as bravery, which is what it is. For those soldiers, it was like, oh, we can do bravery. Oh, yeah, okay, so we're, you know? And so they would sort of open up and bring some more sincerity. And as soon as they did, it was like the floodgates. They were so hungry for this connection with each other. And it took somebody being brave first. It's a kind of leadership. It's not the only kind of leadership, but it absolutely is. How about that first one? Coaching partner who gave value. Yeah. I would say my partner started off by saying I have a degree in psychology as well as business. So I'm like, okay, there's credentials. <laughs> yeah, all right. Let's go have, let's go have dinner, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking about giving and exchange, uh, giving and exchanging value. I'll bring these. Uh, well, actually, why does giving value? Because you were, you were able, when you were especially in the listener mode, to hopefully give some, why does it? Simple answers. Three for four. I think I think there's a natural uh, response and appreciation and maybe that makes you want to try to do something to react the other way. Yeah. Or send something the other way or not. I would guess. Yeah. yeah. You know, we aren't just idle floating beings in the world. Right? We are we are looking for what kind of value can be can be had as I navigate my life. It's kind of simple as that, a little bit of an exchange and then maybe there is some kind of feeling of desire for reciprocity. How about receiving value? What happens when somebody receives value from there? And, and yeah. You, you, you can be grateful or you, you can be thankful for it from an extent. And what does it feel like when, when they receive value from you, when they say, uh, thank you, or when they, yeah, yeah. The appreciation and validation. There's, yeah, it, it, we get a night, appreciation and validation. Like, oh, yeah, I, I happen to give something. It just feels good. In a way, it's tender stuff. I don't want to kind of make this into a mechanical, like, oh, here's how you, know, you 
you can create rapport because it's just the simple things we do in life. And yet, those people who are really good at creating relationships, at creating rapport, are giving and receiving value. They're both skilled at kind of scanning for ways that, oh, I could be helpful, which most of you in the room just do. But for sometimes we kind of forget that that's a way to navigate the world. And also, they have skills at receiving value, right? Being open to being influenced. Being open to sharing, wow, that, that moved me, or that was great advice, thank you. Simple little ways of closing out that you communicate and don't assume that they know that they gave you value, right? Yeah. So these are, uh, you know, we have our two, three minutes, and I just want to let those float there. We can do one of two things, a way that I sometimes close my sessions with uh, large corporate groups is to just have these up here and say, you just did you know, three hours worth or a day's worth and, and I'd like you to just turn to a neighbor and talk about, pick one of those and say what sticks with you. That's one way to go. We could also have just an open Q&A or kind of wisdoms in the room around any of these. So I'm open and in fact, let's try that latter one and see if there's uh, room for people having, I have, I have questions or something to share with the whole group that would be like, you know, uh, this is a way that I've learned and leaned into any of these three. Yeah? About 90% of the people I work with are the most. And I'm a kind of person, and I found the two of the top. Yeah. I'm not cutting them off, but I found the three. Like when someone does something, we'll find them, when like you know something about one, so they're not in the post for a while, just find it, give them something a little bit. In, 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 in the aftermath, let's say, of a conference call, you'll send a specific email or whatever. Yeah, broadly. Yep, broadly. It's absolutely a choice, and, and both have their, their uh, uh, virtues. Yep. yep. Yeah, it is, especially remote, right? Uh, it's almost an art form, really, to have rapport remotely, and, and yet there are ways. It's certainly, with this one, you know, on conference calls, when sort of going wisdom is... Um, requesting that the group have a certain code um, that, that we're all going to not multitask, for example. And we shut our things just for the 20 minutes of this call. <coughs> Can I ask that of the group? Just a, an open request. It may not be honored by everybody, but if it becomes a norm, big difference maker. Somebody else? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Mm. I think that's yeah. I'm going to guess that people can, so I just wonder for the last couple of minutes, microphone, there was a, there's one in the room, some of you have Julie, yeah. One more, just real quick. Oh. Just see um, that people didn't, yeah. So the, it was the last question, uh, the, the last point there, I think there's an importance in the order of whether you give first or receive first. Um, a lot of times it's, it's better to give before you receive, but as you start to manage more people, it becomes more demanding to actually give a lot before receiving, so it's something to be worked at. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions, comments? Yeah? Well, on your hard and soft skills, awesome. hard and soft skills slide, what I really found in managing people is that a lot of people say, I've, I've reached my learning curve, I, I've plateaued, I need something else. And if I sit them down and I kind of show them a similar list, say, OK, you check the hard skills box, but what about the soft skills box? Wow. And they realize that, oh, yeah, there's still a lot where they might be able to learn in this position from using the soft skills. And I always say that, hey, think about 20 years from now or whatever the time frame is, you've been invited back to a school conference as an alum, and they're putting you up as the you know, keynote speaker. What are you going to say made you successful? It's not the stuff on the left. It's the soft skills that probably led to your success in life. And so take some time and, and focus on that. So, yeah, I really like that slide. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just make an assumption that these will be uploaded and that, that they, you're certainly welcome to them. So uh, ping me directly. I'm court at, at, at Berkeley, right? Pretty simple. Uh, to say, like, hey, I, need, uh, I want those slides somewhere. Uh, you know, there's got to be a repository. So you should have them. It is just after 3 o'clock. You are really fun to work with. Thank you for coming. Uh -huh.